talk about um, CICD for database development. I'm going to uh, specifically look at the Azure space, but it does apply to on-prem as well. A little bit about me. My name is Heidi. I'm from uh, Australia, hence the accent. Um, I work for a company called Expose Data Exposed based in Australia. I am a business intelligence professional. I love all things ALM DLM, which if anyone's not familiar, that's application lifecycle management, database lifecycle management. And feel free to reach out to me on um, Twitter is probably the, the best one, um, but all my contact details are there. And if there's any questions you have, don't hesitate to ping me on, on Twitter and just ask, because I don't mind. If you follow this up later and you have a bit of a play and you've got a question, uh, let me know. So I created this presentation mainly because I'd heard about CICD and at the time I was working with completely on-premise infrastructure in an air-gapped environment. So I was looking at it going, can I even use it? Where do I start? Is it difficult? You know, because everyone says, oh, it's easy. Now, everything's easy once you've done it a few times, but if it's the first time you're doing it, it's hard. Or if you're swapping platforms, it can be hard. Um, does it apply to an existing solution? And can I use it for non-cloud things? So that's what I'm going to look at today. And I'm actually going to take you through bringing a database in so you can see um, how we take it from an existing solution through to a solution that has CI, CD associated. So we're going to look at the what and why of source control. The reason for that is source control is like the precursor, the foundational step that you need before you're going to do CI, CD. I am actually going to tell you what CICD is as opposed to just the abbreviations. We're going to look at a bit of a, um, a demo, taking an existing one, and then I'll show you what it looks like to start from scratch, cover off a couple of the gotchas and any questions or thoughts. And as Josephine said, and thank you so much for having me um, at the Boulder SQL group, feel free to come off mute and ask your questions. Unless you don't want to be recorded, then jump at, um, the message in the chat and we'll try and cover it off. So some assumptions, I assume that you're aware of source control and you have access to it. An example would be Azure DevOps or GitHub, um, that you're familiar with Visual Studio and or SQL Server data tools, and you're familiar with the Azure portal because we're going to be using an Azure SQL database today. So the first thing is the what and why of source control. So source control is basically the version management of any file. Um, predominantly non-binary files, so anything from your .sql files that create your SQL Server objects. If you're a um, DBA, that might be your scripts to do any updates or releases or creating of user accounts. If you're an analyst, that might be your SQL queries to get data for respective reports. It's anything that you want to put into a version management um, system, and a source control system allows you to manage those versions. It does let you keep the history over time, um, it helps you with the who, what, when, and a big caveat on the why. It will only help you with the why if someone enters a really nice comment when they check in a change. It is great for backup and disaster recovery in the event your environment disappears. You've at least got a copy of your DDL to restore your database definition, not necessarily your data. It can be good for parallel development where you've got multiple teams working on a database, and there's so many more things as to why source control is the way to go. In terms of who, I put this slide in because sometimes people think it's only for the DBA. It's not only for the DBA, it's pretty much anyone who works with an item that can be version controlled. So today we're working with databases. So that might be your DBA, it might be your business intelligence professional. If you're doing any reporting of a um, application database, then it might be your developers. Or if you've got reports, those may also have their own data warehouse or uh, what is it, data mart. So for those, you might have your report developers using source control. I've worked with executive directors who cut code, so they also use source control. So it's pretty much anyone and everyone. In terms of the when, I treat it as two different things, proactive or retrospective. So proactive is if you're building a new database out for a project or some uh, like a request for work or a change, then that's a good time to start using source control from the very start or you're prototyping some different scripts that you're working on, and you might want to put those into source control so that as you start to work out what's working, what's not working with your script, you can put the versions into source control and have that history over time. And the other one's the retrospective, which is basically saying, you know, you might be in a new job, you've taken on a server, or your company switched from a managed service provider to in-house. You've got solutions already deployed to an environment. 
you potentially need to bring those into source control so that you've got a base point of versioning and then from there make your changes through source control or you've got cowboy development going on and then people are developing straight on the servers so you can use source control to every so often maybe every day every hour bring in a copy of the server into source control so that you have a version managed um, copy as well i have had to do that i had a manager who just dev straight on the server and uh, if anything went wrong he'd often ask us developers to fix it so to save us a bit of um, downtime we would every day source control his um, database and then if anything happened we just go to source control to get the version from the previous day and bring it back uh, in terms of the DDL because it was often changing store procs and things. So I'm going to look at an, an existing solution now we're going to take that existing solution and bring it into source control so that we've got our foundational step for our CI CD. So this is just an Azure SQL database if you're familiar with the Azure portal if you were to load up um, an Azure SQL, create a new one, create a sample, it would be the AdventureWorks LT. So this is just showing us the AdventureWorks LT environment. And we've got a basic database with a number of tables, you know, product, sales, customer. When we try to bring that into Visual Studio, there is the um, concept of a database project. So this screenshots from Visual Studio 2019, we'd create a new project and then pick database. It'll be SSDT in previous versions of Visual Studio. And in 2022, it's also there. So it's a built in from, I think, one of the latter versions, I think the last couple at least, um, database projects is built in. So you would create a new project, database project. So I'm going to actually show you what that looks like so you can see firsthand. So I'll load up my Visual Studio. I'm going to use Visual Studio 2022. So first thing I'm going to do, this is the, the splash screen. I'll just minimize that one out the back. Create a new project and I'm going to create a database project. And that database project, excellent, next. Now do let me know if this is really little. I'll try and change my res. So I'll go AdventureWorks LT and I'll just move the folder into my demo folder. And that's going to create a shell, a database project shell. And if you've never worked with database projects, the first thing um, I do when working with them is I'm often working with existing solutions. So I import in the database and that also gives me an idea of how Visual Studio structures the database inside a project. So the way um, it structures it is important to know. So as you create new objects, you know how to um, formulate them into the database. Oh, Visual Studio just disappeared. It's a good one. Again, it's going to take a little bit to load that splash screen. I'm just going to check if it's created the file in the background. Yeah, it has, so it's just closed. I will just open it up. Opening system. And back to go. demo. Had a little bit of fun with 2022. Sometimes it's happy, sometimes it's not. Okay, so this is going to load up the shell. Once that loads in the Solution Explorer, the first thing I'm going to do, I'm not going to change um, all the properties right now because I actually want a next step to fail on purpose so you can see what that looks like. But if we go to the properties of the database project, there's one setting I turn on, which is include schema name in the file name. This is really handy because every table view, um, a store proc function, it's going to create a file for each one of those objects. So when you are working with the database project, oh, that's interesting. It's just decided to rearrange windows only. Um, when you are working with the database project, so if you have the schema name included, it kind of makes traversing the files really easy if you're just working straight on the file system and you haven't loaded it. The thing I'm not changing at the moment is this target platform. I will change that a bit later because it needs to be Azure SQL, but for the purposes of showing you what a failure looks like on the CICD build, I'm going to leave that as 2016. And I'm going to import my existing database from those screenshots. So I'm going to connect to my environment. So that right click import, I pick database. If you had a series of scripts on your um, hard drive that represented a database, you could also pick scripts and it will interrogate them and bring them in. So for this one, 
I will use my other server. Just grab server address from here. I'm going to use SQL auth. You could use AAD auth if you were doing Active Directory authentication. For the purposes of this demo, I've just gone simple. And I'll pick my one. Get my other demo one. Yeah. And then I'll setting that one up. So rather than mess with it. There we go. So this is a server just has the AdventureWorks LT database on. I'm going to connect to that database. I'm going to leave these settings. I will turn off the logins because I don't need them. And one important one to note is the folder structure. If you're familiar with working with databases inside Management Studio, the folder structure it puts for any DDL is by object type, then the item. So depending on how your team works, that will depend on how you structure the files within the Visual Studio project. So object type is closer to SSMS. Um, a lot of the times I do by schema then by object type. That's purely because I'm often working with business intelligence projects where when I'm doing troubleshooting, I often go to the schema first, then the object. So it's um, a faster navigation for me, but object type is just fine. Go with whatever works for your team. I'm going to hit start. That's going to take a little while, but what it's doing is it'll go out to the database and interrogate all the DDL and it'll bring that in. Hmm, decides to go really quickly today. I have found if I put that as Azure SQL, it'll hang on the login for quite a while and then it'll go through and interrogate. So you can see it's gone through and looked for all the different objects within that database and now it's set them up inside the Visual Studio project. So those tables you saw in the screenshot now appear here as a .sql file. And so this is the complete representation of my database. And then when I look at it, I can look at it in either a T-SQL view or a design view. So now I have a database project with the entire database definition in it. Important to note, this is not connected. It has no um, direct connection to the server. So if I make any changes here, those changes aren't automatically appearing on the server. And now we have that. I'm going to bring it into source control. So before I step into that step, I will show you my Azure DevOps. So Azure DevOps is Microsoft's one of Microsoft because there's two now. There's GitHub and there's um, Azure DevOps. It's their source control tooling. You can use either. I choose to use DevOps because I was back in the day using Team Foundation Server, which is what DevOps became. Um, but you can also use GitHub. If you use GitHub, you'd use Actions to do your CI/CD. But inside this project, I have the concept of repositories. And if I go in here, we'll see there's only the one repository and there's no code in there. So it's come up with, you need to clone it, there's nothing there. So if I go back into Visual Studio now, the simplest way to add, get the right window, oh, handy, is down the bottom here. There's an add to source control. I'm doing Git, you could do Git or TVFC if you're doing Azure DevOps. So I choose to use Git because it's a more industry common um, source control type or the version type for a repository. I'm going to change my account because it needs to be my other one. When this comes back. There we go. This one. And then I'm going to pick my project. This will take a moment to refresh my credentials. There we go. And I'll pick Boulder. And I'm just going to put it in a brand new repository. Um, there's no rhyme or reason for that, just for the purposes of a demo. And I'll save it because it's going to add details about the Git repository to the project. So now that's gone ahead and added that to source control. So you see in the little window here, hopefully that's visible. You can see that a new Git repository has been created locally and that it's tried to push it remotely and it's got a fatal error. Permission denied on the Git config file. Let's just see. I think that would have failed to promote it remotely. But that's OK because I can switch to my other one. There it is, AdventureWorks LT. Let's just see if it pushed it up. Yep, it has. So with Git, it commits locally and then it can push it to a remote repository. 
So now that we have all this, the next step we want to do, so we've got our database, we've got it in source control. So let's go back to the slides and I'll just, there we go. So we've done that first step of bringing the database into source control. So you can see it's quite simple. If you have an existing database, you can just connect to it and bring it in. That's the case whether it's on-prem, whether it's Azure, whether it's Azure Managed Instance or Azure PaaS. Um, on-prem, you just have to have connectivity to the database, of course. And then the reason we want that, obviously, is so that we can do CI, CD. So that's basically why it's important. Also gives us those recoverable steps and everything. So continuous integration, that's the that's what you're here for, is to look at this. So continuous integration is the process of automating those continual changes to a solution. So often when you read the definitions for CI, it's all about um, developers and web apps. So from a database standpoint, if you think about all the times you change store procedures, you change views, you change table definitions, that, that's con continuously integrating those changes into your database environment in whatever role or capacity you're in. So what CI gives you is the concept of as developers make changes or anyone makes changes, I'll just refer to anyone as developers, um, as anyone makes changes, those changes are committed to source control. And then we want a mechanism to continuously build that solution so we can identify if there are any issues. And that's the added advantage you get with using source control and specifically a database project is if someone changes a view for example, and they reference an, a table that's not in the project, it won't build. It will fail to build because it will do that referential checking. Or if someone removes a column in a table that subsequently breaks a view or a store procedure, all those things are going to come out as you do the build. So build gives you that process of if you've got multiple people working on a solution, they're continuously making the changes in the project. As they commit those changes, you can have a product like DevOps go through and build the solution continuously and let you know if there are any errors. So in Microsoft, they call that the pipeline. So inside Azure DevOps, you have this pipeline and I've got to zoom, so um, I do apologize there. So inside DevOps on that left-hand side pipelines, there are actually two pipelines. One is the build pipeline, which is just called pipelines. The other one is the release pipeline. So the release pipeline is more your CD aspect of CI CD. So inside CI, I'm going to create a new pipeline. And within this pipeline, I like to use the classic editor. If you're really good at writing YAML, you can by all means use the, the other ones, but I choose to use the classic editor because I like having the GUI. And I'm going to pick an Azure, Re Azure repo Git that's basically Azure DevOps Git repo. You'll find Microsoft starts to remove the DevOps to, from the long wording. So instead of being Azure DevOps Git repository, it's just Azure repos um, Git. So that's what that's what we're doing today. We've got our team project, our repository, and our branch. Now, just one thing I will point out: if anyone has master in their branch. Just check um, a lot of the tooling changed to have main as the default. So years ago, you would have seen things like trunk, then master, and then more, more recent years, it's changed to main. Uh, I learned the other day that my Git configuration on my computer had the default set to master still. So I had to change the initialization configs and then that put it as main. And I'm going to pick empty job because all I want to do, so this is a pipeline. I'm not going to change any of these settings. This is basically where it's going to do the build. If you were working on-prem, you would use a hosted agent as opposed to the Azure agent. You would use a different one there to say, go run this on my internal build server. So we're going to run the MS build task because all I want to do is build my solution. So inside MS build, we get to pick the solution from that repository that it's connected to. So I pick my AdventureWorks. And that's basically all I want that to do. What, but once it's done the build, I want to copy any build files that it creates. So I want to copy those files. So picture on your computer, if you're doing this manually, you would have done a build a Visual Studio solution file. It's going to create a .dac pack file. So basically what I want to tell the pipeline is do the same steps I would do manually. Did we get my little post-it note? There it is. But do that inside the pipeline. So these things here, what you'll see me paste in is some variables. And in my slide deck, I show you the um, Microsoft Docs, but these are inbuilt variables. But basically, this one takes the output of the previous step where it's working inside the agents build directory. So I want to take a particular folder path 
from there and I want to put it into the artifact staging directory. And the reason I do that is so the next step, which is publishing, publishing will take the build artifact staging directory and it'll drop those files um, into a location that's available. So I'm just using some pre-built variables here to take the build and then place it in a specific place. And then we want to publish that artifact. Publish build artifact. What I want to do, and so you see automatically it picks up the path to publish is that build artifact staging, and it'll call it drop. So all this pipeline is going to do, take our Visual Studio project, build it, and then put the build or the DAC pack file along with the other um, bin directory files inside a drop location. So now I can save and queue that. So we're going to just create that as our initial pipeline for build. And these are all versioned as well, all your pipelines. So a lot of the settings I leave as normal because this is more of a 101 how, how do pipelines work from a basic level if I wanted to just get started. You can do more advanced things where you put in different security controls, different um, pipeline configurations. So now that's created my pipeline and it's going to go run it because I said to queue the pipeline. So anytime you want to run a pipeline manually, you queue it. Then it will sit in the queue. So you can see here sitting in the queue. And then once an agent is available in the hosted environment, it will go run this pipeline. So while that's running, I'll just refresh. So we can see now it's started. And if we go into that, when my browser refreshes, so if we go into it, you can see all those steps going through. And it looks a lot like if you did it on your local computer. So if you were doing a build of a Visual Share project, you would check out the solution. So you can see the various commands as it checks it out. Then it'll go through and build the Visual Share project. It'll go copy the files over because we've asked it to copy files. Oops, still running build. And it'll place them in the drop location. So I'm going to let that run in the background. And while that's running, I will show you some more slides and then we'll come back and we'll do a release pipeline. Let's see if I hit the right button here. There we go. So we've set up the build pipeline and as I showed you those couple of variables in there. So Microsoft have a number of inbuilt variables that you can work with. So that's on the docs page under pipelines, build and variables, and you can go through and change all the different variables there. And if you wanted to do any other steps within your project, you might want to run some security checks like the white source bolt add-in, or you might want to change specific things. You might want to run a PowerShell task after to modify your build slightly. You can do all those in the pipeline as well. Anything you would normally do for your current deliverable where you build a project and release it, if you are using Visual Studio projects, you can replicate the same sort of thing inside the pipeline. But the next thing we're going to talk about is the CD aspect. So there's two definitions for CD, continuous delivery and continuous deploy. And unfortunately, I always get these back to front, so I'll just describe them generically. But basically what one says is take that build and create it to a point where I can have someone in the team or another process release it to an environment. And the other one is actually doing the release and the deployment to the environment for you. So some organizations, they'll do continuous deployment all the way through to production. Others might go, I'm going to do continuous deployment to dev and test. But for production, I'm going to have one of my staff members take the drop file and manually do the release under our change management controls. So that continuous delivery, when you hear people say CD, it could be they could be referring to they do it all the way through to they've got a bundled solution ready to deploy. Or they could be talking they have it all automated. So the CICD process does the deployment as well. And it's not something where you can't introduce human approvals or because you might have a change management process that says we only release at certain times, or you can have the build ready to go. And then once your change management approves it, you can go into the pipeline and say, yep, this pipeline's approved to actually do the release. So if we look at now setting up a release pipeline, and I will show you that failure I talked about earlier because I wanted you to see what a pipeline looks like when it fails. So now our build pipeline has completed. So we, you saw me create it and you saw it running, but if I just skip and come back, so this is how you would view your pipelines and you can go in and edit them. 
through the hover. Or if you wanted to see has a pipeline been run, you can look at it in the runs. And anytime you can go in and see what actually occurred. So I can go in and see this particular run and see in all the changes that have occurred for it. But if we skip ahead now to releases, oh, hello Google, my phone's reacting to me. So if we create a new pipeline, I hate that the names are exactly the same, but it is what it is. So we're going to create an empty job. There are a number of templates there, but I'm going to do an empty one. And I'm just going to leave stage one called stage one. I don't need to change it. First thing we need to do is tell this pipeline what artifact is it going to work with. So this adding an artifact, that's referring to, say for us, it'll be the DAC pack file from our build. So we say we want the artifact to be from a build. The build is from this particular project and it'll be the Boulder SQL user group CI pipeline. And we want to take the latest version. So I'm going to add that. So now it knows when there's a build, this is the pipeline that's going to work with that. You can have multiple pipelines building and you can have multiple pipelines using those build outputs. So you don't have to have one and one. Um, might change depending on how you do your releases. Here we want to tell it what, what is it going to do with that artifact. So we go into the job and task area here, and I'm going to say I want to add, and for me, it's going to be a SQL deployment. So I'll say Azure SQL database deployment. And then we set up all the different configuration steps. So my subscription, and with any luck, it will load my subscription for today. So I'm going to use my MSDN platforms, and I need to authorize it so that this pipeline has um, the capability to work with that subscription. This will take a few minutes. While that's happening, I'll put in my server address. So I'm going to deploy this one to my demo server. Override the AdventureWorks LT database. If I could spell. I'm going to use my SQL Server Admin. Now, while I'm using SQL Server Admin, I wouldn't recommend uh, this approach. So this is just for demos. Um, I obviously wouldn't hard code a password in here. The reason being is anyone that has access to this Azure DevOps project, if you don't restrict access to your pipelines, they can come in and see the configuration on a pipeline. What you will most likely want to do is put these in variables. So you'll see here that you can use variables. And within the variables, if you use a variable group, you can actually configure that group to connect to a key vault. So you can more securely store your configuration items. So for the purpose of the demo, I'm using um, the SQL Server admin account, but you may want to look to either use, I think it's a principle, service principle, um, or use the variable groups with the key vault configuration and put your settings in there. And now this is authenticated. Excellent. So we've got SQL Server. We've got our server. We've got the database. We've got the um, login, the password. We're going to say deploy a DAC pack file. So now we need to pick from our drop location. So when we did the continuous build, we said these are the things we want to put in the drop. So inside drop, it's taking everything for me. I'm going to go in and find the DAC pack file. And now this particular task is going to take that DAC pack file as an output of the build and it's going to deploy it to my Azure SQL um, database. So now I want to save that and queue it. I don't think I put any other settings. This one, not for the minute. So I'll save that and I'm going to create a release. And I don't want to intervene in this in any step. So I'm just going to say create and that's going to go ahead and create a release. So a bit similar to how you saw when we created the build pipeline, when we create a release pipeline, you get a similar viewpoint of you see the release, you see as the agent is working to find an available um, host, and then once it's run, it will start. Once it's the available, it will start running on the agent, and you can watch as it runs through the output. This will fail on purpose. Um, it will fail because the database target is set to SQL Server 2016 instead of Azure SQL, which is where it's trying to deploy to. So we'll let that fail first so that you can see an example of it failing. Give it a moment. Hopefully. There we go. 
So this is an example of when a pipeline fails. So if we go back to releases now, we'll see the release and you can see the little X and you can see it failed on stage one. And then I can go into that release and see what happened. And so I can replay that same log and see all the same information you saw as it was running. So how do we fix that? Quite simple. But if I was to go ahead and fix it right now, even though I have a pipeline that is configured to use that particular um, source control repository, that pipeline wouldn't trigger. So we need to first make sure that pipeline is triggered so that anytime someone does a build, uh, does a publish into that or a commit, sorry, a commit into that repository, it kicks off the pipeline. So if we edit this build pipeline, you'll see under when it loads, there'll be a little tab that says triggers. In that triggers tab is the option to do continuous integration. Let's load that up. We'll enable continuous integration off the main branch. So I'm going to save that. I'm not going to queue it because I don't need it to fire off another build. I just need to save the change. So we can say adding C. Cool. Now, if we go back into Visual Studio, go back into Visual Studio, right click the project, go to properties, change the target platform to Azure SQL. That will be a change. So you'll see down the bottom, it will show you a little one to indicate there's a change. I'm going to commit that change. So we'll say uh, I'll get platform to Google. And I'm going to commit that and push it at the same time. So first you notice it only creates it locally. So you'll see there it's done the commit to my local repository. Now I need to commit that to the remote repository. So I'm going to push the change up to the remote repository. Give it a minute, there it goes. So now if we go back inside our pipeline, that should fire off shortly if it hasn't already, and it has. So now we can see in the runs, because I said continuously integrate, that pipeline says anytime I get a commit for that particular repository, the AdventureWorks LT under the main branch, fire off this build pipeline. And so that's gonna do its thing and build away. And like before, we can go in and watch as that's building, but I'll let that run. And once that builds, because the release pipeline is set to trigger from that artifact, the release pipeline will automatically trigger. Good so far. So I'll just check in. Does anyone have any questions or any thoughts they want to share with the group? Well, there's nothing in the chat yet. Oh. All yeah, this is good. I think so far so good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Right. I'll leave that running for a bit. Because it will take a moment to run. Sometimes this can take longer than other times, especially because it's waiting for a hosted agent. So if you've got a lot of different builds going on, don't expect this thing to fire off really instantaneously. Um, but it's I've never had it take longer than a few minutes, but that's because I'm just doing demos with this one. Um, but that's now completed our build run. So if we go into the releases now, we should see the release has fired off. And it hasn't because I didn't configure it to. Let's edit that. Make sure I trigger that one. Yes, all right, missed a trigger on that one. So you see the build automatically fired off, but when we looked in releases, the release hasn't automatically triggered. We've still only got that one release we had earlier. But if we go in and edit that release pipeline, the little lightning bolt, turn on continuous deployment, trigger. So now as it finds a build to fire off, it will fire off the release. I'm just going to say to me. And I'd probably put more useful comments than mine. Uh, just so that over time, if you ever want to see how someone's changed a pipeline and you're looking at the history of it, so in this history tab here, you can see the different changes. You may want more useful comments so that you know why someone's gone and changed a pipeline. Now, to make sure that we pick up that latest build, I can actually create a release, tell this pipeline to run ad hoc. So I'm going to tell it to run and go ahead with no um, checkpoints. 
and create. And so now it's created that release too. So hey, I got a question in the chat. Yes. Do you, do you have a high level CI CD flow or representation in slide format from start to end? I don't in my slide deck, but I will find one and get it to you. OK, because there are and the high level might vary. So if you think about it from a high level of source control, build pipeline, release pipeline, that's one thing. But when you see how some people configure their pipelines, it's really dependent on your um, business. So your build pipeline is probably going to be the same, but your release pipeline will vary. So in mine, I'm only releasing to one environment with no checkpoints. Um, so before these were running, so I could have a release and then I could have a gated checkpoint to say, I need someone to approve it. My stage might be stage one, go to development. I might then have a stage two, which is deployed a test, and a stage three that deploys to release. It's really contingent on how you operate your business and your change and release process, um, but I will find you a good overall slide. Okay, cool. So now we can see this is deploying. And that'll go through and publish. Now there's no change in this one, so it's not going to make a change to the database. But that's so that's sort of your end to end. OK, I got a quick another question really quickly for you, or I'm not sure how quick it is. Is there any way to view the deployment script for our review before the deployment will start in the target environment? Yeah, so if you do in your release pipeline, if before you actually did um, the stage, if you added a approval step, so when you come in as that, as for example, as an approver, you can go into the artifact and you can grab the actual artifact drop. <coughs> so it'll take you back into the build where you can get the drop file. And I get the menus wrong, but I'll see if I've clicked the right one today. Because it is, no, that's the change one. I don't want the logs, I want the actual drop folder. Done it before. Just gonna remember where they moved it. Yes, yes. In short, yes, you can review the actual contents of it. It's just accessing the drop folder that um, for that particular build that you get visibility on the drop folder where you can download it. So you can download the DAC pack file and all the contents. You can't see in terms of Similar with on-prem, if you do DAC pack deployments, you're basically saying, you know, SQL XE deploy this particular DAC pack. So you don't necessarily see the script it creates for you with the DAC pack deployment. But if you're familiar with doing it on-prem, the, the um, pipeline is doing the same thing. So when you watch what this actual log does, you'll see it do the whole execute pass in the DAC pack. OK, cool. Oh, that's deployed. Excellent. Because I got it zoomed in. I need to zoom out so I click the right thing. Longs. This one I want to see. Load. Yeah, so you see, this is the action it's taking here. So similar if you did a DAC pack deployment on prem, this is very similar to what you would be doing on prem. You'd be specifying run the executable. You're going to publish. The source file is going to be the DAC pack where your target is. So the the actual pipeline is doing the same thing you would do on-prem if you did this style of deployment because some people will just in Visual Studio right-click publish or schema compare, diff, diff will generate the script for you, the, and then manipulate the script and then publish. One thing I didn't um, show here is when you're doing these deployments, if there are certain things you need to run, like you've got a not null field or you've got security you want to apply, or for example, your SQL agent jobs, you can put them in pre and post deployment scripts inside your database project, and then those are fired off 
um, in sequence. So it'll do your pre-deployment, then your DAC pack, then your post-deployment. So any sort of specific stuff you want to do, you can do in those scripts. It might even be when you're doing database deployments, you have static um, tables. That might be your configuration items or some master data sets. Those can be stored inside scripts and then you run those as part of your deployment. So now that we've got our end to end, let's go in and make a change so we can see how that works. So if we go back into Visual Studio, I'm just going to get, say, the product table. And no, I want an address table, actually. Address table, I'm going to add a new column. So I'm going to add the type of address. So that might be residential, postal, um, or the like. I'm going to allow nulls for simplicity. Save. And then I'm going to commit that change. This way. There's more ways to do this. I'm just showing you a way. So we'll say adding the address type field for RFW1, for example. And I want to commit and push. So that's going to commit my change locally. Then it's going to push it remotely for me. It's kicking off the push there. Spin wheel, spinny wheel. So this is where your parallel development comes into play because if you've got multiple developers working on the project, you can all be committing changes to the repository um, independently and you can be pulling other developers' changes into your version so that you're continuously integrating locally as well. So now that's put the change into the repository. So if I go first, go into repos, and AdventureWorks LT, look at the history. I will see my change here to say adding the address type field for RF1. And because we told the build pipeline that it's going to continuously build, it would have kicked off a pipeline to say, right, I've got a check in. Let's go run the build process. So you'll see adding the address type. And this is the other cool thing that pipelines do for you is not only will they show the commit history inside the pipeline. so as you keep committing and continuously integrating, if you need to see what changes went in, you can see those. And if you get in mature teams or just pretty much any team, if you start using the work item feature within Azure DevOps, so that's similar to uh, if you're using the Atlassian suite, that would be Jira. If you're using GitHub, that's GitHub issues. And for um, Azure DevOps, it's the boards, which includes the work item functionality. But if I was to check in against a work item, then the build would actually include the list of work items included. And so when you think about that in terms of your change management and your um, internal development work, that's creating your release notes for you. So you can go, here's the release notes of what we've got included in that build. So as you start to use the different features, you know, if I enter better commentary on my check-in, those are going to appear in the build. So I can see, right, these are all the commits that went into the build. So now anyone in the team that's doing the release or if you're going to your change management group and they go what went in um, on this day you've got the list of changes so you've got all those there so that's finished the build and we'll go into releases and see that that's kicked off release three and by the way this um this is in australian time apologies i should have swapped to american so it's a bit more relatable but um, basically, switch those two around and change the time to about, I don't know, 16 hours. Um, oh, no, that's fine. Yes. I think so. That's fine. <laughs> so we have that. another question, question, too, if you are if you have a sec yeah, yeah. here. Yeah, go for it. So uh, there's a question on the post-migration scripts. How does the deployment know when it doesn't have to run the migration script, like if it's already been deployed? Yep. And the follow-up on that question is, what if you restore a back of a prod to a test environment and then run the deployment? Will it know which migration scripts it needs to run? Yeah, sure, sure question. Uh, great question. Um, short answer would be no. It doesn't know that it doesn't need to run. It's just okay. a script that'll run. So a bit like when you used to do, and, and people do it today, is where you do if object exists, do this first and then run. You kind of have to defensively program inside your post deployment script to say, Hey, if this already exists, don't do it. Um, you may even want to try a strategy that works with, uh, was it MVC um, app development stuff where they keep a table to say these are all the migrations that have gone in and it does yeah. up down sort of style. So it doesn't know. You have to build in those sorts of checks. Oh, okay. In terms of your backup 
and restore, it will just run the post deployment script as is. So it depends on how you program that post deployment script as to how it runs. It's always going to run though, you can't not run it. And so while this is building, I'll show you what I mean by pre and post deployment script. So when you're in the solution explorer, let's just say this is my DDL for my database doesn't mean I can't add new folders. So I'm just going to add a new folder called miscellaneous. <coughs> Spell it wrong, I know it. Close enough. And then I'll add a script. And each script can have a type. And then when you're working with files, you can say things like build, compile, exclude. You know, you can have files sitting in your project that are just ignored. Um, but you've got these two, your pre and your post deployment scripts. So if I add a post deployment script, and we'll just leave it as the default name, minus one. And you see how that pops up. So it runs in SQL command mode. That's important to know. But it means you can also reference other files. So I could have a series of scripts here that are my static data sets or creating my agent jobs or adjusting my security. Because even though I can bring security into a database, if your dev environment is in one domain and your test and prod are in another domain, having one set of security in there is just not going to go to all environments. So sometimes your post deployment can be used to go, all right, if it's production, then deploy these accounts with this role security. So you will have to program in to say, look, if the database is at this step, don't run this script type thing. Um, but it really depends on what you include in there as to how you want to work around it. But it knows this is the post deployment script. It will have a property of post deploy on the build action. If this was just a generic script, that I didn't want to run all the time. I just wanted to include it in my source control project. It might be like my test data script. So when I deploy this database to dev, I might want developers to be able to run a script to create a whole bunch of test data. I could have a script sitting here and just change the property to just build so that it builds the script but doesn't actually execute it in any of the releases. Um, but it's there in case I want to do something with it at any point. And I can potentially access it in the pipeline if I wanted to. But that is your, your post deployment. And there's another one for pre deployment. So that might be pre populating certain um, instance configuration items. And that's gone and finished. Let's see if my Azure Data Studio has connected. And it has. Excellent. I picked the right database. I did. Great question, by the way. And I changed address. We go in now into columns. We should see a type field. And there we go. So you can see how changing in the Visual Studio project, then committing it, kicks off the build pipeline, then kicks off the release pipeline, and I'll allow my changes in my database. Um, I'll just race through the rest of the slides. I think I'm over time. Oh, if you were doing it for a new database, what's the difference? Just change the database name. So if I take that same release pipeline, I can make a copy of it, create a new one. If I just, instead of calling it AdventureWorks LT, I just called it, you know, AdventureWorks, it would go ahead and create that database for me. So if you're doing it for a new database, it doesn't have to exist. It just means when you're filling out the release details, you indicate what server you want it on, what the database name will be. If it doesn't exist, it's going to deploy it from scratch. If it does, it's going to run a DAC pack deploy over the top. The sort of uh, where do you go from here? I highly recommend giving it a go. Um, use the AdventureWorks LT sample if you have, say if you have an MSDN subscription or if you have some free Azure credits. As you're stepping through creating an Azure SQL, one of the last pages on the um, setup is to say select sample. That sample is the AdventureWorks LT database. So you can give it a go. Um, I'll skip questions to cover gotchas and then we can cover off any questions before we finish. So one thing to do, take a backup first or consider adding a backup step into your pipeline. Um, think about how you're going to add not null fields because if you added a not null and tried to deploy, the deployment would, would fail because it's trying. If it if the database already contains data, the deployment will fail because the DAC pack will go. I'm trying to deploy a not null field to a table that's already got data in it. So you may want to add it as null and then have a post deploy script to change it to not change it to not null and populate all the fields. And of course, if you've got data, use pre and post. 
Um, when it comes to multiple environments, one of the thoughts is how you handle that in your release pipeline. You might want multiple release pipelines or you might want one release pipeline with multiple stages and then have approvals or some sort of check within that to say, right, this pipeline can run to dev on its own, but as soon as it wants to do a test deployment, I need the team to sign off. As soon as it wants to go to production, I need to do a sign off. Think about securing any of your passwords. As I said earlier, look to use the variables and groups and you can always see the history. So similar to if something goes wrong today and you need to know what happened to your environment, you can look and see if a pipeline ran to know that, okay, there was a release that went out. Oh, the release accidentally included some changes that we weren't expecting to go in that release. Some errors, you saw the one about the target platform. Another one is if you do an incorrect password, when it tries to deploy, it won't um, work, it will error. Whole bunch of further information, all the sorts of things that you might want to have a play with or get some more details on. Um, and then even look at Git branching strategies because you might want to do branches to go through your different environments that way. And then a huge thank you um, for having me and my various different haircuts. So thanks heaps for um, letting me present today and for all your questions. I really appreciate it. So. Oh, yeah. no, I see. I see all your hair colors. You're right. I was waiting for that slide and then I forgot that it was coming. I actually oh, yeah, have longer hair it. now. It's weird. <laughs> yeah, I love it. But yeah, so and, and if anyone's got any awesome. feedback or stuff, demo, different demos you'd like to see, feel free to um, send me a message. You know, I don't mind. Like I had um, Greg Lowe uh, in Australia got gave me some feedback, which was really awesome for me. So he actually let me know how to change the master configuration in Git because I wasn't sure how to change it. So now I have main as my default. Um, yeah. OK, OK. So let me ask you this, since I since we, you had an Azure SQL database, could you do this as well for on prem database servers? I wasn't sure. Yeah. Yes. OK, that's what I thought. Yeah. I thought that was the case, but OK, I wanted to make sure. OK, that's true. I did put that in the start and I didn't cover it off. But um, yeah, you can do it on prem. The difference is when you're doing those pipelines, it's automatically a hosted one. Mm -hmm. But you see inside the configuration. On that very first default step where it's picking the agent. It will be a hosted agent. Whereas you actually, there's a, you can download, there's download and executable. That then goes on to an on-prem um, accessible PC. It's a bit like on-prem gateways, if you've ever worked with those, but you basically set up an agent on an on-prem server. Oh, okay. Or a developer laptop, as I've seen, um, or, or desktop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You put the <laughs> agent on there. Yeah. The agent is then configured to do, to work with that DevOps. And then so when you're doing your pipeline, instead of saying, you know, take the one from the pool, you actually pick one that's going to be a locally hosted one. And the same with the release pipeline, instead of it running on the remote one, you pick the on-prem one. Okay, and you can, okay. And probably the other thing is I use Azure DevOps service, so the cloud version. Um, you can use Azure DevOps Server if you're in more of a disconnected, like um, internet, non-internet accessible environment. You can use Azure DevOps Server and set up the build server and do it that way. Okay, okay. So it does work with both. Cool. Um, one of the hard ones is where you're doing a, a little bit of hybrid. Like if I've got some servers on prem, like I, at the moment I've got on-prem servers that I'm migrating. And that becomes a challenge because the target platform on the Visual Studio project is set to where it's going to expect to deploy. Um, I haven't found a good solution for that one yet. So I leave it as the on-prem one. Um, and then once I get closer to finishing off the migration, I'll probably switch it to Azure and put the CICD on for that group. Okay, okay, that's cool. And there's other cool features. If you've never played with database projects, um, I'm using Visual Studio. You can use Azure Data Studio. But the other fun one is people never realize that there's a schema compare and a data compare inside Visual Studio by default. So I don't have to have a project, but I can oh. compare my server environment to my project. So I might connect this to like AdventureWorks LT on my demo server. That's fine. True. And this is where if you've got cowboy development going on, which I'm not saying is good, bad or otherwise, it, it just happens. 
Um, <laughs> but you can compare. So if I did a bit of cowboy development now, if I just go in and go, oh, let's change, say, customer. What does that look like? Which I'll leave that one there, but I'll just do a new query off here. Oh. Manage Data Studio IntelliSense. Hello, bro. I'll just overwrite this one with some different stuff. Ad hoc table. Let's say I did that. That's only on the um, server. So now we've got a uh, customer ad hoc. Doesn't exist inside my database but I can compare my server to my database project, sorry, database project, I should say, mm -hmm. and then this will flag any objects that aren't in my project or are different in my project, mm -hmm. and I can hit update, and that will put the table inside the database project. So that's where if, you're, if you've got people or if you had to do, say, an emergency fix in production or test or just in an environment, but you needed to make sure it comes into source control, you can use the schema compare to bring those changes in that way and then keep your source control in line because it is disconnected. Okay. Uh... Quite cool. The data compare is okay, but it only works with keys, tables that have keys. Oh. So if your table okay. doesn't have keys, then Redgate is the, the better tool because you can do custom key on that one. Oh, right, right. That makes sense. Yeah, the Redgate tool. Yeah, I have, we have that. Okay, that makes sense. We don't have stuff in source control. Well, that's not true. We have a couple databases in source control with Red, like Redgate and GitHub and Octopus Deploy right now. Nice. Yeah, but, 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 yeah, it's, the problem is that we put it in there and then sometimes it didn't get used and I'm not really sure that it's accurate in there anymore and anyway, it became a mess. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I, I, I experienced that in recent times. <laughs> it just gets, yeah, I don't know. It just gets messy. And like you're saying, it's not just DBA responsibility at the beginning, right? In your slide, it was sort of this, everybody's pointing finger in like opposite directions, pointing at somebody else. Like who is going to do this source controlling of the databases? And yeah, we have a lot of databases that don't have keys on them and stuff and oh boy we have we have a table that's it only has four columns thankfully but it has 20 billion rows and it doesn't have a primary key even so we have some like things we have some things going on in our environments <laughs> so this is the thing like, i sort of go sometimes you know as much as i love source control and cicd it's not always going to be something that is instantaneously there in any team like mm -hmm. sometimes I might use it to go, right, the team doesn't have their databases in source control, but I know we're doing a big piece of project work. So for that project work, I'll make sure I'll bring in their database, I'll work on it in source control, and then I'll just periodically bring it back in from the server to make sure any continued work that's going on is in the copy I have just for my own sanity. Um, for the project work I'm doing, like at at the moment, I have that with about 10, 10 different databases between landing and warehouse. And I found in some cases, I'm like, hey, guys, the database doesn't build because there's objects in here that obviously didn't get cleaned up over time. So even if you use it as like a once a month, all right, we know going to source control completely is going to be a little bit of a journey. Mm -hmm. Let's just start with once a month reviewing, does our database build? Do we have artifacts in there that are no longer relevant to the business? Mm -hmm. And because you've always got your database backups. So your backups, well, yeah. hopefully you've always got database backups. If oh, not, yeah, yeah, start, that, start that first. <laughs> <laughs> if you've got backups, you have a recovery point. Um, and sometimes things like this, having the database project, if it's a bridge too far for a team you're working in, it might be something you use from time to time. Like, hey, we're going to spin up a new development server or a system integration or a disaster recovery. Rather than backup and restore, 
we're going to just see could we recover from scratch. So I'm going to take I'm going to take the DDL off the server we have. I'm going to put that in a project, and then I'm going to deploy the project to the server. Then I'm going to try and run our day-to-day -day ETLs and see if they work. If they work, we've got everything we need to rebuild. If they don't work, it might be, oh, we have this table with static data to tell us what day we're loading. Let's put that in a post-deployment script and okay, and then just update it like once a month. Or you might even say, you know what, I'm going to bring the on-prem databases. I'm going to put them into database projects. But the only time I'm going to use them is if I need to spin up a development environment for any developer. Then they can grab that, update it, deploy locally. Because I can't give them a backup, like some companies have policies saying you cannot have production data on a developer machine. Right. And when I say yeah. developers, I mean anyone working with a database. I just refer to them as developers. Um, right. So yeah. to get around that, you go, okay, well, guys, grab database project, can point it at production, get the DDL, and then here, publish to your local um, to computer, you know. So, or it might be, Let's set this up. We'll have CICD. It'll spin up and put the databases in Azure so that if we want to evaluate going to Azure, do we have anything in there that's going to break? Or, okay. Okay. So it's, oh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Because, I, I mean, as much as I, th I find source control great, I do understand that for me, I've been doing it for a few years now. So for me, I see the benefit and I love doing it. But if you're brand new to it, it's very overwhelming and it's a lot to take in. Like, yeah. I've seen teams where CICD is a bridge too far. Like that's a couple <laughs> of years away for them. And just, just getting that source control step is going to take a little while because even something like Git, doing check-ins and check-outs in Git, mm -hmm. you know, the whole push-pull sync branch, that yeah. can be overwhelming in itself. So that's why I sort of say, but as much as I love it and would do it any opportunity I get, I also understand you've got to start on the journey and then work what's going to work in your team. Like if you already have a change management process that says we need this information and then we go to this board for an approval and then we go to this architecture review and then we go in, if you can replicate that in a pipeline, then go for it. Yeah, or, or look to change your process at the same time as you're automating in a pipeline to go, okay, we want to do continuous build and deploy and we want to deploy all the way to development and work with your change control board to say we need a standard change that every week at this time we're going to deploy whatever we've got. And we'll have a record of what we deployed in the CICD tooling, but we won't have it in the change management um, tooling, whether you've got like ServiceNow or Eat or, mm. or whatever, ticketing system. Right, right, yeah. For but sure, it, yeah. And you might even say, look, let's just bring in the database project and run a build. Let's just have it automatically build. And then you can put notifications in on those builds to say, hey, team, the build failed. And that way you've got an earlier time frame to let you know that, hey, there's a problem with this build, as opposed to the build gets handed over to a specific team or an ops team to do a deployment. And then when they go to deploy, they go, hey, this doesn't, this doesn't deploy. <laughs> yeah. So even putting this running in the background, 24 by 7 on all your commits, don't necessarily use it for your deployment, but use it to check, is this buildable code? Uh, mm, yeah, that's a good, I like that idea. That is a good idea. I think you can, you can take the journey to the nth degree or you can start with the basics or you might just have it as a little covert thing running in the background just to give you a bit of a sanity check to go right. Mm -hmm. The environment is okay. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think... I think right now, like we're we're at my team especially is like, well, that's a bridge too far because there's only two DBAs and my manager, and it's sort of just like, well, we'll just wait to do that till some other future date. Like any CI/CD would date. We have CI/CD for development, like app development stuff, but we just don't have it set up for a database yet. But and it, and you tell her a lot. You can start if you've only got one. If it's only yourself, you can start. But I also understand that if you're working in any teams. If you're the one that gets it, trying to be the one that also has to train and teach everyone on top of your day job can be yeah. a lot. Um, and yeah. some people are really adaptable. They're like, yeah, this is great. Let's learn it. Let's do it. And other people are like, whoa, 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 whoa. I like my my script, my one script. What are you telling me? I have to use a project, you know. So, yeah. And then it's whether you want to put yourself in that position to deal with the, the pushback and the training. Um, 
Yeah, and that's yeah, it's another issue I think that we've encountered because we don't do a lot of database changes either. So then it was sort of this thing to like do this whole CI CD for database. Then you're thinking, yeah, geez, this is a lot of work. I mean, I even felt afraid of that because I like doing new stuff. Even I was like, this, I'm just too exhausted <laughs> to begin this. But I like this presentation though. I mean, I like seeing it in action. But the thought of implementing this, right? Like you said, a bridge too far, and I'm just like really yeah. chuckling over here because I just think to myself, I need a nap just thinking about it. <laughs> and you know, and and that's the thing. Like that's why I tell people, this is like a 101. This is just telling you the art of the possible. But then you know, I've got databases that have circular dependencies, and that just creates a drama oh. when I try and do oh, yeah. this. And so for me, it's like I do for that particular piece of work, I do it database projects for my build to make sure we've got all the artifacts and they build so I can CD on, on them yeah. because that is a bit too far for the team right now. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta see like, yeah, what they're actually doing. Sorry, my cat is not got camera off, so there's a lot of, sorry, there's weird, a lot of weird noises over here. He got very excited by the screen and started pawing at it. <laughs> like, I love CICD. <laughs> And like you said, like if you're if you're in a DBA space where you don't make a lot of changes, your more critical thing is probably automating your backups and checking the backups uh, have no corruption. Right. Yeah, and we I do that. I have automated automation. Yeah. Exactly. I've automated and all you, the checking of the backups. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like it's it's also a case of where you spend your time. Like if you're in your database changing it constantly, or you have an issue where multiple developers are working on stuff and they keep um, removing each other's changes because they're not aware of the other person's and how they do a deployment is like a clobbering one as opposed to like a diff and then keeping their stuff and not someone else's. Um, then something like database projects might help with that to go, right, everyone, you work in your own branches and then when you want to go to a development environment, you push it through to the, the main branch and then we use the CICD to get us out into the development server so we know everyone's changes coexist. Um, so you might just use it for the integration step, but not for the for the pre steps. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. So many yeah. options. That's a hard part. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> so many options. Like it depends. Uh, yeah, of course, right? I know. <laughs> I feel that way. I present on auditing a lot, so that's the same way I feel about auditing. I was like, so you could do this, and you could do that, or you could just do a little, or you could do. A, you mean, yeah, just do something. That's my take on it. Anyway, yeah, that's great. I really appreciate you coming to present. And hey, no problem at all. Thanks for having me. And thanks everyone for sticking around. That's in your evening. Yes, Where exactly. Enjoy your afternoon. And I'll I'll get this posted up to YouTube probably in like a day or two. So and I'll send you the link, Heidi, too, so you have it if you want to use awesome. the link anywhere or whatever. So yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. I'll watch it back and just be like, all right, fix that, fix that. <laughs> I know. Oh my! I tend to not watch my presentations after, unless I'm recording beforehand, and I have to watch it to see if I said um too much or something. Oh, yes. But I tend to not watch it because I hate the sound of my voice. It's <laughs> I sound completely different. I crack up. <laughs> the, the other thing, I'll send you the slides, Jasmine, because if you can't see anyone wants them at the after my thank you is all the screenshots. Um, oh, okay. Of a run through, so people will be able to watch the video. But just in case they want to um. Okay. Try, try long. I've got that in there. Okay. Do you have the slides anywhere like in GitHub or anything like that? Or I will work on it. I'll put them on my website. I have a website. Oh, okay. Now. Okay. Yeah, you can 